Okay, welcome. Happy holidays and welcome to CAPCO's uh, latest and last webinar on capital markets in 2020. I'm Dave Feltis and I head up CAPCO's FMI practice in the UK and I will be moderating today's discussion. CAPCO has about 1,000 professionals in the UK and about 5,000 globally and it's focused solely on financial services consulting. In the UK, we have about 700 staff who specialize in capital markets, which makes CAPCO one of the largest consulting groups solely in FS. Today, we're gonna to explore innovation in the financial market infrastructure space. And we have a very esteemed and senior panel who are gonna represent key segments of this space, including trading and clearing models, post-trade services, new matching and clearing technologies, and FinTech startups. So a bit of housekeeping. After a quick presentation and then a panel discussion, you will be able to ask questions in the Q&A section, which I think you can access uh, and find at the bottom of your screen. I'm sure but by this time in December, you were all experts in uh, Zooming and et cetera. So, so let's kick off. I've asked my colleague and friend, uh, Jibran Ahmed, who's head of our research and development, as well as head of CAPCO's uh, Digital Innovation Lab to join us. Jib will briefly talk about some of the, the ways CAPCO is helping our clients rapidly turn ideas into practical value add solutions. Over to you, Jibs. Thanks, David. Um, so yeah, as, as David said, I head up our digital lab in the UK. Um, my background is largely technology and capital markets. Uh, you know, uh, started my career as a software developer and then moved more into the architecture space. And in the last five years, more focused on the innovation technologies in capital markets, but also other areas of financial services. The purpose of our digital lab is to work in conjunction with our clients across financial services to help them explore new ideas or explore ways of solving existing problems with new techniques and technologies. That can be anything from how to automate an existing manual process using technologies like machine learning through to defining a completely new business proposition and building a prototype that can be tested with users to prove that the idea will work. Over the last year, our lab has built a proof of concept for an email analytics solution for an investment bank's operations function which uses machine learning techniques to analyze email traffic in shared inboxes to optimize the distribution of workload and to identify opportunities to automate the most common types of manual work requests. We've also helped the retail banking client understand uh, the gap in the market for a particular segment of customers and define a new proposition along with a prototype app to test with customers and their board all in the space of two months. And we do that using deep quantitative and qualitative research from those customers. We've also built a proof of concept in less than three months for a perpetual KYC solution, which changes the way KYC is executed for corporate customers from being a, a periodic, manually intensive activity to a process which continuously identifies changes in key data from external sources like companies house, and then updates the customer's risk profile on the fly and uh, alerts a human wherever a significant change in, in risk has occurred. And, and we're using uh, graph technology and machine learning to make that happen. And, and those are just a few examples of the types of things we've done. Um, you know, we've done a variety of other things, typically short, sharp projects in the space of a month to three months max. Um, to make all of that happen, uh, we pulled together a small team of, of researchers, designers, architects, developers, data scientists, and, and financial services domain experts to work on very short focused projects, which are designed to demonstrate value very quickly with as small an investment as possible. That's kind of the, the, the way we see innovation um, sort of external to an organization being done in the best way. We take a, a design led experimentation approach, which puts the human, whether they be the customer or the user or internal staff at the heart of our methodology and it combines that with a scientific hypotheses-driven testing approach where you, you come up with a hypothesis, build a particular experiment around it and validate with the users whether that hypothesis is true or not. And then you adapt your solution uh, iteratively going forward and keep testing new hypotheses until you reach a solution that works. And what that methodology essentially means is that we engage the users throughout the process using quantitative and qualitative data we gain from them to better understand the problem and better understand how any proposed solutions are actually performing and to keep refining the solution until we have something that truly solves the problem in the most effective way. And that approach also means we're driven by structured research rather than 
um, sort of generic statements or or um, novel ideas that may not have been uh, validated. Um, it also um, it also means that we're aligned always to the business because not only are we engaged with the senior stakeholders who have asked us to come in and help them with that particular innovation project, we're also engaged with the customers and users of that product or service. And we do all of this in a very agile way of working, incorporating modern technologies and techniques in everything we do to ensure that we deliver value quickly, we fail fast where appropriate and can adapt to the user feedback. And that ensures that what we do is fast and cost effective. And we also use our own lab as a sort of guinea pig for testing new, new ways of working from the mix of skill sets you have in the team to how you validate an idea, how you prioritize ideas, how you make decisions on what to keep, what to kill, how do you best work with big and small technology vendors uh, and, and things like that. And we take those learnings to help our clients set up and run their own labs or innovation functions. And that's actually one of the most valuable outputs from our lab rather than the, the technology elements of what we do. And, and we've used those learnings to help some of our large clients create their own innovation labs or refine how their innovation labs work. And we've helped a couple of very big capital markets firms embed our design-led experimentation approach into their back office functions to create or to increase the speed at which ideas go from a, a post-it note on a wall to a live solution um, that you can test with customers. And, and we've also um, been able to use our methodology to uplift the, the functions knowledge of modern technologies, uh, adopt more modern agile ways of working and generally become better at, at getting new ideas live. Uh, and we've also helped some of our clients set up new innovative ventures outside of the main organization um, so that they can experiment with new ideas in a, in a more greenfield, unrestricted uh, environment. And, and I think um, David's gonna to touch on that a little bit later. So that's a very quick summary of what we do. Um, as we head into the new year, our lab will be putting more of a focus on market infrastructure, um, as we see that as being a space where there's a big opportunity to apply our methodologies and some of the um, emerging problems there are, are very interesting. Uh, from a personal perspective, having a capital markets background um, and having done some work in, in the market infrastructure space, I prefer tackling some of the bigger, more complex problems in market infrastructure. So I'm quite looking forward to hearing from our panelists on some of their challenges and ambitions. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, David, back to you. Great. Uh, hey, thanks, Jibs. I mean, I really love what the digital guys are doing. It's effectively a rent of innovation lab and uh, for different places. It's quick, it's relatively cheap, and it's got really, really smart people. So, okay, why are we talking about innovation? Innovation is such an overused term these days. One of consultants like myself and strategic advisors we use it to try to lure and entice leaders to spend scarce resources on new projects, new products, and new people. Innovation as a topic has been around a long time, and I'm certainly not innovating in terms of webinar top topics. But as, <clears throat> but as I see new technology and innovation in other sectors, such as the payment sector in Asia, these are making massively rapid gains. Uh, I wanted to explore the state of innovation in, FMI, in the FMI world as well as kind of wholesale markets in general. There's been over 20 years of academic study and structured thought on the topic of innovation. It's taught in most MBA courses, particularly in the US and has been the source of way too many books and TED Talks. Yet during COVID lockdown this summer, I came across Matt Ridley's new book called How Innovation Works, which I highly recommend. In it, Ridley states, and I quote, Innovation is the most important fact about the modern world, but one of the least well understood. Ridley goes on and, and uh, I encourage you to read it, but innovation is often messy. It tends to be highly collaborative. It's extremely unpredictable, but it seems obvious in retrospect. I think there's some potential lessons from the, the Tesla situation. Okay, so my interest was piqued again about uh, what I thought was a, a well-tread topic. So I began speaking to colleagues in the FMI space, including some of the, uh, the people on this call. Uh, one senior exchange official from a top five exchange boiled down their approach to innovation to do something different with value. She explained that the with value is the key factor or doing something different is either just creative or inventive or you know, 
gets you marks from your, your boss on the KPIs, but it may not be in the best interest of either stakeholders or shareholders. Uh, to be effective, she said, one has to move the needle either way on cost or efficiency. So to create a clear definition before we start, and I'll do the introductions then, uh, I believe innovation is the requisite trailing process behind technological advancement and client regulator demand. It's demand with meets Moore's law, if you will, in many ways. Okay, so now uh, on to the research. Um, <clears throat> in the FMI world, groups have been developing formalized innovation structures for the better part of a decade. And they've used uh, several of these structures to achieve results. Some have built internal labs to help facilitate projects from concept to launch and dissolve internal roadblocks such as maybe between clearing and tech or some startups internally. Uh, some have used internal uh, VC groups to identify new tech and IP that's on the horizon so that they can stay cutting edge and bleeding edge. So what's around the corner uh, in terms of uh, IT that they can invest in and sort of see <clears throat> and maybe borrow uh, some of the IP. Uh, some have uh, used external piecemeal investments in order to be involved in uh, targeted strategic areas. So if you wanna get into FX, you may invest in cobalt, uh, say is, is one example I think that SGX did. Or um, some other examples, and I think some of these have been more creative, uh, are setting up a separate sister exchange uh, or partnering with someone else. Um, backed, ICE is backed as, as well as SDX has done that. Okay, we benchmarked some of the groups along the capabilities and funding matrix, with both factors being either centralized or decentralized. So in this chart, it's kind of anchored with Google X in the right-hand corner. Google X is uh, parent company Alpha, Alphabet's vehicle for moonshot concepts, such as driverless cars, Waymo, Glass, Loon, and Wing. It is wholly funded and it's controlled by Google. And then when something comes to fruition, it gets spun out into, into its own entity. It is an incubator, if you will. Um, SDX and ICE is back, they're separate entities, so they're more in the middle, but they, they've had JV collaboration agreements with other key stakeholders. CME not only had the first internal innovation lab, but it's also had a pretty successful VC fund, just like the DB1. Um, LSEG has made some very targeted investments, particularly in the DLT settlement area. So I think, I think I, we can agree that FMIs are, are, they're active in the innovation space. So now I wanna to talk to our panel and see if they are really doing something different and how much actual value are they producing? So my esteemed panel and introductions, again, thanks everyone for joining. Jake Pugh is the proprietor of the Pew View Limited, a boutique consultancy that provides advisory and business development services to exchanges, market infrastructure, and e-commerce firms. Jake has nearly 40 years in the experience. Sorry to age you there, pal. Uh, and he's pretty much seen it all. In addition, Jake was elected as an MEP in 2019 and served as an expert member of the European Parliamentary Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs. George Raddick is CEO of the Alternative Derivatives Exchange, otherwise known as ADE, a soon to launch electronic venue for trading a range of, of digital assets, uh, either cash or as futures, et cetera. George is a serial entrepreneur as well as a successful former trader, and he has been a leading innovator in digital platforms, building not just bleeding edge matching engines, but clearing and custody capabilities to boot. I've seen lots of exchange in a box concepts. I've not seen one that actually works until I've seen ADE. Uh, James Davies is co-founder and chair of the London Derivatives Exchange, an FCA authorized trading platform in derivatives and digital assets. James understands the trade life cycle better than anyone I know, having worked as a technologist, programmer, exchange executive, innovator, dishwasher across multiple asset classes from commodities, rates, FX, to digital assets. I hate to say it, but he's way smarter than me. And last but not least, Danny Corgan is founder and CEO of London Reporting House, a technology startup in the reporting space. Danny's an experienced ex executive in trading clearing, reporting, and perhaps the foremost expert in the world on Eastern European market infrastructure. He truly is the broker's broker in FMI. Okay, so introductions out of the way. If the key to innovation is understanding and defining value, 
and new innovations, I'm interested to figure out from you guys, what is driving demand? So with that, Jake, what's driving participants in market infrastructure to innovate? Thanks, Dave. And I was going to start off by thanking Capco and yourself until you use the F word. Thanks so much for using the word 40. That's um, that was great. Um, I think I think you nailed it in your brief introduction, talking about the exchange exec saying doing something different with value. So we we all know that the FMI space has uh, sort of enjoyed a rising tide over the last 20, 25 years. And I, I like to use a sort of sporting metaphor that your strength is your weakness and your weakness is your strength. So all the big businesses that we're familiar with have been able to grow top line operating margin and trade at amazing multiples. And that in a way has been a slight constraint on innovation because there's always the risk of dilution. But I think actually what we've seen in the la during 2020 in terms of two things really, divergence in performance has been really interesting across the sector. You've got some firms like Market Access who are way above their pre-COVID high and others who are substantially below it. So you're getting real divergence in performance across the sector. And I think the other thing I'd mention is the strategy in the M&A we've seen this year. So you've got some very much doing the consolidation play, whether that's LSE Refinitiv, 6BME, Euronex Borsa, and then what I'd describe as other firms going down a more adjacent route. So uh, ICE with Ellie May, NASDAQ with Verifin, Deutsche Börse, ISS. So I think we're seeing a bit of a divergence in the strategy. Um, the last thing I'd say is kind of, I'm a bit of a fan of the sector really. And I, I, I think the businesses are open to the innovation, but one of the problems they do have, particularly in the cleared space is the speed at which they can introduce new products because of regulatory permissions, particularly on the clearing side. So that has been a constraint, but I'm, I'm not kind of excusing them, but I think 2020 has really set us up to really to force the exchanges to do something different because those very high operating margins, those multiples have sort of slightly broken down. So they're going to have to do something more creative going forward. I think, I think you're right. I mean, in my previous lifetime uh, in exchanges, the question that was often asked with new ideas is, is it accruative? Are you going to dent my marginal operational margin uh, which, uh, you know, in exchanges can range anywhere from 40 to uh, 75%. So uh, I think that's a really, really good point. Okay, James, over to you. Who amongst the key players are adding real value? And, um, you know, what's, drive, what's the customer demand? What's driving demand? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the value add at the moment is in terms of growing the pie for financial markets rather than just moving it between different entities. It is coming out of the innovation in the small to medium sized businesses, uh, the entities that are trying to, to bring a new product to market in in areas where maybe there has been a lack of innovation in the past, such, past, such as uh, retail brokerage areas, uh, inequities, uh, seeing, we've seen constant innovation in data, but it still feels like there's a long way to go in terms of data and innovation and connectivity. And I'm, I'll leave that there because I'm sure Danny will talk about that more later. But I think the difficulty is now, how do those reach the next level of maturity? Uh, how do the major components within the marketplace, the clearing houses, the exchanges, uh, the senior investment banks, how do they take and adapt and adopt those innovations into the existing market infrastructure? Because there are so many barriers there uh, for them to be able to, to handle that coming in. So. What this is going to take is it's going to take a lot of the uh, larger marketplace starting to look at all of the new and emerging technologies, not just from the perspective of the market solution that they're bringing, but the platforms that they're operating on. So when I say see innovation in smart contracts or I see uh, innovation in DLT settlement or uh, innovation in, in trade reporting, at least as interesting is seeing the underlying technology that is 
coming to a much more mature place to support that, to see containerization, to see orchestration, to see uh, real, really the emergence of, uh, of Java as, as the go-to language instead of uh, a number of big installed on a piece of tin languages from the past. So I think when the adoption can come from those uh, larger entities to really support the smaller uh, to medium-sized entities that are coming in and support their technology infrastructure, that's when we'll start to see some of the change. Great, thanks. I think, uh, George, let me ask you, you're a former trader um, and traders often, I think, because uh, you know the edge is, is always fleeting. Uh, are often big drivers of demand um, and, and ask a lot of their, their FCMs and their exchanges. What drove you as a trader um, and entrepreneur, what drove you uh, um, to, to set up a new exchange and, and new technology? That's a pretty good question, Dave. Thank you for that. So <clears throat> as you rightly said, basically we were trading for quite a while and we just saw that there was a lack of innovation, real innovation on the part of the incumbents in terms of listing new products, in terms of new technologies that would improve margin efficiencies, both across exchanges and across product groups. So we see this largely driven um, by the global financial crisis, basically initially with a lot of products going onto screen, onto central clearing. As a result of that, you had larger exchanges basically uh, getting a, a shot in the arm. They're, um, balance sheets became bloated, there was a bit of complacency perhaps, and um, as a result of that, a lot of innovation has been driven offshore, and basically we wanted to port some of our strategies onto these newer venues, these challengers, and once we did the audit of the technology, we just concluded it was inadequate for institutional participation in terms of the order capacity in terms of the APIs they use just across the board, the technology seemed as though it was made by people who used to work at Uber rather than CME or ICE. So um, we just saw a gap in the market there. And um, what you guys touched upon also I feel is very important in terms of <clears throat> the barrier to entry in terms of cost of technology. So a lot of these larger venues that do lease technology on a SaaS basis, so I, when I say larger venues, I mean NASDAQ, for example, they don't necessarily have an offering um, for the entry player. So there should be a scaling of technology, you know, a lower capacity exchange technology uh, for the uh, startups and then scaling up to a larger capacity institutional venue. And this is again, another, um, area where we saw uh, a place where we could contribute really. Excellent. Um, I think uh, technology, uh, what, what used to take, I think, a long time to develop. And I mean, uh, I, I think Deutsche Borsa was, uh, was the early movers with their uh, DTB and then UREX platform. Um, and then, uh, you know, some of that technology is now still on a five to seven year cycle. And I think it's hard to innovate and hard to, to stay cutting edge if you've got that big of a cycle and you've got that many different products. So I think it's good to see new entrants that are really trying to push not only on the high frequency side, but also on the, the functionality and the capability side. That's right. um, okay, so Danny, who's winning the innovation game today and what's, what's driving people uh, to a new reporting house? Hi, uh, Dave, thanks for having me on. Uh, well, in, in this, the world, the post-trade uh, transaction reporting world, you, you're seeing a lot of people exiting in the market. And for some of the reasons why Jake just uh, talked about, one, they're all regulated, the TRs are regulated. So the exchange-owned TRs are pedaling backwards or pulling out. Uh, and you've got very few people coming into the market as ancillary service providers for a number of reasons. The, and I'll come to those in a second. But the, the, the game is the following. We, we know at the moment there's an arms race on around data. We've seen the three big mergers. And as I said in our chat earlier, I'm not sure which one of those big ones is going to be the AOL time uh, Warner merger, as it were, and perform that way. But this, is, if you're looking at anything, it looks like top of the market push for data because people, what, what the, the race there, the arms race is, is to get the data. And I'd say two things. There's such friction between those that want the data and those 
that had the data. So the banks, of course, are the ones that are paying for most of this market data, you know, around certainly orders, uh, and the exchanges and the likes are the ones that, that own it. And the prices just go on and on and on. And we have these uh, amazing multiples, as Jake said. So I think where the innovation is going to be is, is not in gathering the data and getting the data out there. It's the realization that the data is already there. So I'm going to take a comparison between market data, data all around, including market data. Let's, let's think of that as orders, trades, then end of day valuations, and then all the things that happens the next day uh, for settlement valuations and so forth. That's where there's a lot of cash. But where the data sits nicely and cleanly is in regulatory reporting data. So the mythology out there, we've got 200 people on the line. If we, we did a poll of them, they'd say, how well is regulatory reporting going? And to uh, a man and a woman, they'd say, terrible. And it's just, that's not true. The data now is very good. Uh, the, uh, what actually happened is the reference data has been cleaned up at the banks. And so a typical trade that gets report, the fields and so forth, covers everything, reference data, counterparty data, and the trade data. That string out to 150, 160 fields is enormously valuable. But information is valuable if it's timely and relevant. And that string isn't relevant. But a lot of people can't read that string. It doesn't have a UPI, for instance, describing what the product is. But if you can read that string and get it in a timely fashion, it will reduce market data costs dramatically. So what you need to be able to do is read it. You need to gather it and read it and so forth. Now, the reason that the trade repositories can't do that themselves is one, uh, certainly in the European Union, you're not allowed to uh, commercialize that data. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the UK afterwards, but they certainly can't at the moment. So none of them provide ancillary services in that manner. And secondly, they've got terrible technology, terrible, terrible, terrible technology from 2010-12, which was set up for EMEA, uh, MIFIR, and, and then SFTR. In those days, as you remember, the cloud was not permitted. Now the cloud is encouraged. So the, my view is this. Everyone's looking for market data. It's already there, it's, but it's in the wrong, it's in a different form. It's in regulatory data. It's in strings you've got to be able to read and you've got to be able to access it. So I think it's the, one, the, the innovators that are going to work are those that have cloud technology and maybe even DLT on this for life cycle events for trades. So there's no better data in the entire world, for financial markets, than that string of data. But of course, you need to be able to read it, aggregate it, uh, enrich it if possible, and get it back to your clients. And that's what we do at London Reporting House. So we're charging for people to, reward, uh, to report, but we're giving them their data back. It is their data. And that's the other big battle that's eventually going to happen, of course, is who believes the data is theirs. But I would certainly say it's theirs. So in summary, everyone's looking for market data and paying for it, and it's there under their nose. And they just don't know it because the cleanup operation that was done for all this reporting has meant that firms before couldn't access the data. Now they've got it, but they just haven't spotted it. Once they spot it, once it's, they realize it's usable, then we're going to have a situation where you have vast amounts of data and imagine if you put it out on a giant big table, a little bit like Churchill in the war cabinet rooms, you laid that all out there. People would look at it differently. They'd say, what's, what's use is that down there? And the salesperson would say, that's great information to know how my client's traded and levels and so forth. The trader would see it as valuable. And it all depends. And you remember I said it's timely and relevant. Yeah. So that's all relevant is how you get it timely. And we believe at London Reporting House working with Settle, who is this fantastic technology company run and set up by Anthony Culligan and Peter Randall was one of the co-founders there as well. They are all about speed. If you can work with that in the cloud with DLT and working with the TRs, the information becomes timely. So right now the information is close of business, T plus one. That's a lifetime away. If you can, if you can do it, if you can get the data, read the, read the data, get it back to your client, they'll be able to do things with it. That story then goes on from there. I think, I think uh, you know, reg reporting was the biggest thing that really kind of, and, and, and trade repository, that really came out of the crisis in 2008. Because funnily, funnily enough, the Brazilians had a requirement that everything OTC or listed had to be in one place and it had to be in a, in, in a, a reporting venue. So when the crisis in 08 hit, uh, they were able to open the box and see where all the risk was. And so I think, uh, you know, th there's been some bumpy roads 
Um, and trade reporting is not always, uh, an, other than your passion, is not always the sexiest thing. But I think it's important that, uh, you know, not only for the markets, for the regulators, but also, um, like you said, enriching value. Because that we're right now in the phase with exchanges and clearinghouses, it's all about data enrichment. Because that's, to Jake's point, that's what's driving a lot of these multiples. Okay, so... Um, and, and, and James, you brought this up a little bit. I've been torn. And one of the reasons I really wanted to kind of explore this was, was is the innovation in FMI space is accelerating or, or is it lagging? You know, five years ago, we were all told that smart contracts and DLT would revolutionize capital markets, that um, <clears throat> there would be digital gold and I would have near-term collateralization. And yet now, five years later, it hardly seems we're no better off when it comes to the certainty around smart contracts or some other things. Plus, I think the poster child of blockchain in, in the DLT um, was ASX uh, digital DLT replacement with chess and, and, and partnership with digital asset, which I know it works, um, but it was announced in 2015 and it's not launched yet. So we're not really getting more rapid development cycles and, and, and I don't think it, it's overly impressed. So I'm torn on one way that we might be lagging, but at the same time, I see new products galore. Um, and one of my favorites is the, the success of Doc uh, Sanders Ameribor Index, where he took a problem, uh, which is LIBOR manipulation, um, turned it into a startup, built an index, Morphed it in, uh, morphed it and partnered with CBOE Global Markets, use their technology distribution regulatory skill, and it's now a successful new product, you know, with real traction. So, and Danny, I'm going to throw it back to you. Um, you know, in terms of uh, innovating new products, what are some of the barriers and you know out, that are out there, and where else are you seeing real value? in services that are being created outside just the reporting space? Well, um, I think the real, the real value is, is actually not in reporting at all. It's just a step on the way. It's to get the, the data and use the data in a, tra in a trading manner, to be honest, to give away the secrets there. If you can get the data, well, so, so that's where the value will be, is uh, taking the data out of the re reports, working out what's useful, aggregating it and getting it into uh, indices forms or contributing to, to indices. And that would, you know, then you, you're joining the arms race there because you're joining in supplying uh, indices to asset managers who may be ex, uh, issuing, uh, investing in exchange traded funds and so forth. So the, the, I think that it's the second generation of that. So market data leads to a regulatory data, the regulatory data leads to real good information, real good information is then acted upon, and I think ultimately is uh, is going to be pushed towards becoming a trading, in the trading environment. I think the barriers to that is going to be the following. That kind of data, now we're saying an anonymized, secure data and so forth. Uh, I can't imagine what the regulators are going to say about this because in America, they introduced something called trace so that all bonds have to be reported in a certain period of time, a long, long time ago. And I think what would happen is if uh, the, this process is get speeded up and people are using the information wisely within the firm and then within user groups and so forth and indices are formed. I don't know what the regulators are going to say because that this stuff could come to, if, if not real real time, but not far away. And, you know, we've had the fuss over the consolidated tape alone. If it, This would be like a giant consolidated tape. So you'd know whether everything's traded almost immediately. There's no way the big banks are going to allow that. <laughs> No way on God's earth, because that's that's where all the market data is. Why would you be bidding up market data if that case if that if trade data like that in an anonymized secure form form was made available? So I think the idea is that you've got to watch out for the breaks on the system there. That may come from the regulators, or the regulators may go the other way and support it and say, this is what should happen. But so I think the incumbents will we see something where you know multiple different entities will spit their data into a cloud and then and then AI vehicles of both buy side as well as sell side firms will be able to chip and chop and filter and go forward. I mean, will the regulators allow that? Would they want to allow that? I think the regulators will go for a model for pulling data for themselves and be, I think, quite happy for, for people to make that available for sure. Because it, let's be honest, it's the institution's own data. It's theirs. It's not the regulator's data. It's their own data. 
And I think they would encourage that. Certainly FCA would encourage that. But there'd be a lot of people trying to discourage that because straight away you would realize there's a client of a bank where you've traded, where someone else has traded, and you're going to work out, are you top of the pile or not? So there will be, uh, I think there'll be a lot of, lot of uh, barriers in that. But that, 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 I think that's going to happen over, over the foreseeable future. If people wake up to the string as being very, very valuable, one of the natural goals is that it will become more timely and you'll be able to execute, not quite execute, but not far away from that. And uh, then it does depend on those that own the data now, what are they up for sharing? So Dave, that whole idea of doing that in the cloud and everyone sharing things, never going to happen. All right. They're not for sharing. <laughs> All right, uh, James, hey. barriers. Um, complex, uh, you know, there's, there's cost efficiencies are, are, are the things that people drive towards, but one of the biggest issues is complexity. Mm -hmm. So how do we overcome this complexity? I mean, it, the post-trade processes and, and, and a lot of the, the post-trade software, et cetera, you've got multiple instances from multiple different firms in these back offices. Uh, it's costing these guys, you know, firms a lot of money. How do we untangle the web or how can we do that in an innovative format? So it's really interesting because I think the majority of uh, new firms coming to market with new products underestimate the complexity of the marketplace that they're trying to sell into. They underestimate how intertwined custody banks and asset managers are. They underestimate the roles of brokerages. Uh, and I, I think that's even seen when some of the more mature FMI uh, market players try and bring new product to market, that they underestimate the amount of components within the marketplace that need to be lined up to make that product successful. <clears throat> so I think I could answer this in a sort of fairly flippant, straightforward, easy way that uh, insurgents uh, and new startup businesses need to employ people from the market uh, to consult for them who have years and years of experience who can actually explain the marketplace that they think their innovation is going to fit into so as they can actually test the thing before they try and bring it to market. And that, that would be the probably one of the easiest ways to market but i think that's relatively unlikely that they're going to do that in a broad enough way the quality of research that people need to do and the understanding that they need to have about how their innovative product is going to fit into that marketplace is necessarily high they need to get uh, an awful lot of buying around that industry to bring it in so smart contracts talking about uh, dlt type products with uh, stuff from ASX, but smart contracts in general have not delivered yet every single Deloitte, Capco, KPMG, every single large report that comes out to the market says that these are going to be the future of how uh, capital raising, uh, exchange of equity, exchange of debt will happen. I'm, I'm unconvinced that that's a smooth pass through it. I think blockchain has an enormous role to play in it, but it's only going to work if the smart contract design is actually built in a market aware way. So if you build a smart contract that allows people to exchange ownership between two, two different parties, uh, and you don't handle the fact that you've got to do a thousand different corporate actions from things as simple as dividends uh, to maybe warrants that need to be exercised within that smart contract back to those wallets, then you're not actually replacing any of the infrastructure, you're adding another piece of infrastructure to solve a problem which is there in some areas, but it's not, not really the fundamental issue or the fundamental cost that's around that. So what, we, what we've been working on the last two years is trying to understand what that space is and see what a smart contract needs to have in it, because we think small and medium-sized businesses are prevented from raising capital in an effective way because of the cost of the infrastructure to do that when the innovation comes eventually, it's probably because businesses like us will get bought by a larger entity, brought in, and then have the uh, horsepower and firepower to, to start to change the platforms that are delivered to allow it to support this type of infrastructure. Or our idea will get taken by a large exchange and implemented in a way that they will slowly roll it out and develop it. Either way, it's good for the, for the marketplace. So that's the the innovation complexity from the perspective of the insurgent. And just 20 seconds on the other side, these techni technology platforms to deliver this are so easy, but I just don't see people 
taking the steps within core infrastructure to actually understand how straightforward it is for them to be able to innovate at relatively low cost. The imagined barriers within large institutions to the cost of innovation are unreal when you've been sat on the other side of the fence. That's great. That's interesting. James, question, off the top of the head question, we had a discussion 20 years ago, I think there may have been libations involved, about potential big players. And the big player then was Microsoft, who's yeah. now obviously, uh, you know, Google, uh, Amazon, et cetera, potentially coming in and not only buying an exchange group that they potentially could afford, but, but um, bringing in some new technologies, et cetera. Do you see that happening? Are they still afraid of the space? Um, it, it's the same. It's the same answer, really. I, I think I now understand it a little better. I mean, my, my thought back in the late '90s and sort of 2000 was: Why are the large technology suppliers not coming into the market space and taking relatively commoditized views of big pieces of financial market infrastructure? They haven't done that. They continue to stay on the side. But that's because of the complexity, which we can see on the financial side from the 2008 crash and the intertwined connectivity between all of the banks. The number of people who I think understand this, that I can think I can have a deep conversation with about it, or some of them are on the call. I mean, there are a few people I respect as much as Jake's views on financial markets. But a, a lot of them are dialed in. There aren't hundreds and thousands of these people with actually good views across the whole of financial markets who can go into those businesses and say that's a commoditized product that you can stick up on aws uh, and allow someone to launch a container on an instance for it and the way they run i don't see that changing right now because i don't see the impetus for them to buy that knowledge in and learn it i think they've been afraid of the regulators that's you know there's there's no doubt about that in the past but i i think you're starting to see them play around in the payment space um because that is emerging um, with Alipay and some of the things in Asia. So uh, one, last, one last line then, just you are spot on when you said payments in Asia. Payments in Asia, payments in Africa uh, are the places where the largest amount of innovation is going on across financial markets. It's just so much innovation. Nerd stat, first half of this year of 950 million eligible people, in China, I know it's larger, but but uh, of those eligible with a mobile phone, 825 had done a mobile digital payment. So whether or not, you know, we open up, et cetera, um, it's happening. And I see that it's, it's going to just bowl over the West, uh, which is one of the questions. So, George, I want to bring you in on terms of, you know, barriers in, in, in tech and, uh, and, and, and really... Um, what are we seeing in some of the tech stuff? Do you, uh, do you have smart contracts in, in ADE, I believe? You've yeah, done it, haven't so, you? So, so tying into what James was saying, I think there is still a lack of understanding of the technology as, 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 a, as a whole. So specifically when it comes to smart contracts, um, what people tend to miss is that each product type would need to have its own individual smart contract managing um, its settlement and clearing procedures, i.e. post-trade. Um, and I think once you look at it from that point of view, then you can also um, basically stratify the regulatory side of things as well. Um, they've introduced lower classifications for exchanges, MTFs, OTFs, in order to encourage uh, competition and listing of new products, yet those same new exchanges have to rely on the same old central clearing procedures that have existed for 20 years and are simply inadequate for any new product, really. So um, that hinders innovation. Um, more broadly, though, I would say that the technology basically, uh, DLP specifically, allows for the shortening of the settlement cycle, allows for real-time risk management, real-time settlement, which results in lower uh, counterparty risk and should result in lower capital requirements, which then drives lower fees. So um, there is potential in the technology. What we've done is basically apply um, DLP or smart contracts for futures clearing. And our opinion is basically that the regulators shouldn't be treating 
a liquid exchange traded product with real time risk management, the same way an opaque voice traded product is treated in terms of central clearing. If I can manage risk across multiple venues in real time, you know, liquidate positions in real time, have mark to market, that's not the same and shouldn't be treated the same. Really, from our perspective, the thing that's missing is regulatory changes on the clearing side. And we feel that that would drive innovation. In terms of what's missing in the space itself, I think James touched upon it quite well. There is a lack of expertise in the challenger space, if you will, and um, a lack of adequate solutions for challengers uh, to launch. So the incumbents, the solutions that they offer are simply, you know, they price out um, challengers, and I think a lot of them fail for those reasons, basically. I, I, I really do think that the next big paradigm switch will be with the risk model. Um, you know, CCP or SPAN or, or VAR, or these risk models, et cetera, were built to do an automatic pay and collect once, twice a day, or if something hits the fan. Um, but to have real time or near time collateralization will low, lower risk, lower capital costs, et cetera. And I, I can't wait for it to happen. I think- uh, We are there. We are there from a technology standpoint, we are there. Basically, from our perspective, you know, the larger entities, CCPs, et cetera, they're, they're reluctant to basically give it a chance because they see it as uh, potentially endangering the larger piece of the cake, which is uh, their existing business, basically. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, Jake, how do FMI stack up in terms of uh, relative to the banks, in terms of their they're innovating, how uh, uh, bringing new products to market, uh, um, you know, it's their technology even. What do you think? Okay. Um, I just want to come back a little bit on the, the point that, that George just made. I, you know, when we're talking about the FMI space, the thing is so huge that I think it's quite important to be, to try and be a bit more precise. So I think a, an optimal post-trade solution in a securities market is I think completely different to an optimal post-trade solution in a derivatives market. Derivatives markets need batch processing. We all know that intraday leverage is completely different to overnight leverage. That's what drives volumes, that's why people trade. All the biggest uh, trading shops, houses in the world, you need that distinction between intraday and overnight leverage. Whereas in the securities world, real-time settlement would be a massive plus. And I actually see, and it kind of links with the payments point, one of the biggest things going on in the space now is the electronification of fixed income. That, uh, that's exploding the volume. We all know from our uh, you know, experience in the industry, that means the volume of trades goes through the roof, but the size of the trades contract. And the post-trade solution in the fixed income space is really, really antiquated. And so I see, we've talked about, you know, kind of bottom up people coming up with new ideas and how, that difficult, how difficult that is to penetrate, get traction, investment, and the rest of it. But actually I see in the fixed income space, you're gonna see a top down thing, which is like, we need to solve the settlement cycle for fixed income because it's uh, because of the electronification, and that's going to have to happen really, really quickly. And so, I mean, you, you mentioned payments. I did a thing because of all the M and A. So, S and P market is about 125, 130 billion uh, combined, all all stock. That's about the same as ICE and CME combined. PayPal market cap 250. So you just, you kind of the scale, the scale of the thing. To your point specifically, Dave, I, I, I do think there's, there's innovation out there. I, certainly from the exchange perspective. I mean, if you go out there with new business ideas, I know Danny's getting lots of traction with London Reporting House. James, I know has been involved in loads of new initiatives. You, you can get as many meetings as you want. People are definitely, they want to meet, they want to hear stories, they've got ideas, what's going on. Um, I think 
everybody's open to different commercial models. You can't use, you know, call it JV. You can't use the expression consortia anymore. Uh, but it's tough. I think an example like, say, Skytra, which is a you know really interesting new market, brand new asset class, fantastic data, really interesting. Nasdaq actually, Georgie, like came up with a you know technology solution for an, for an early stage player. The problem is getting the industry connected, because if you're if you're J.P. Morgan, you're going right. We got. We got so much to do with our existing technology stack. You know, what's the business case for us connecting to this new market, which then drives that biz dev into the existing players. Da, 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 da. So, but I, th I think, you know, come back to it. It's really important because FMI is so big. It's like to divide it up a little bit, security, derivatives, all, all that kind of stuff. But I, I, I do think that the market environment and the changes we're seeing in market structure, specific example, fixed income, but also the divergence in performance, I think we're going to see much more uh, true innovation and change in the next year or so. Thank you. Thank you. That's very, very good. Okay. We're at the witching hour of questions and we've got some good ones. Um, so uh, I will open this all to, up to everyone. Um, um, are you finding that larger F, uh, FIs are looking to buy rather than build? James? I mean, it, it, that's always cyclical. Uh, it, it, uh, as Jake just said, everyone will take a meeting. Uh, it's getting them to do something after the meeting that, that's key. So it, there is always a group of them that are willing to build uh, and there is always a group of them that are willing to buy. And as everyone moves a seat, the new CTO comes in uh, and flips the direction just to show that they're doing something. So there are plenty of them out there who are willing to have conversations about buying. There are others that seem to be building, with the exceptions of uh, of groups like ICE that seem to steer a steady ship towards more more money and more income. Uh, the rest seem to move through cycles of changing from one thing to another. Anyone else comment? Uh, okay. Yeah, I would largely agree. I mean, it goes through cycles, as James said. Um, but I would say that the key core components are generally bought rather than built. I mean, they a lot of the times they try and build it internally, they spend a chunk of money, and then they give up and try and buy it for a fifth of the money that they spend developing it and failing. So that's, that's usually the pattern. And generally speaking, again, looking back, you have the LSE still using the Millennium Matching Engine that it bought in 2010, I believe. L, um, NASDAQ still using um, the M2 Algo matching engine, which was bought in 2012. So again, these are legacy technologies that were bought from other entities rather than built in-house. So. One of the things we've been, we've been noticing, and I think uh, the exchange space did pretty well during the volatility of Q1 um, in terms of holding everything together, record volumes and, and, and orders, et cetera. There, there were a few wobbles. Uh, one FCM had, had a little bit of a hit, but nothing nothing bad, and I think generally pretty good. Since then, we have had um, five or six of major players have outages. And I think, you know, the, the, the UK is leading with the Bank of England's operational resilience, and we're doing a lot of work in that space. But, uh, you know, NASDAQ's uh, uh, new launch in ASX gave them the worst week they've ever had. Uh, and, and the regulators now causing, calling for uh, competitors. Uh, Deutsche Börse, I had an outage, not just with theirs, but um, with, uh, with 13 of their, their, member, their partner exchanges. Are we seeing an area where technology is old or are we seeing an impact of COVID uh, on, on, you know, the skeleton crews can no longer really do either upgrades or maintain uh, over a long time? What do you guys think? I would, I would argue that it's a bit of both, really. So there's definitely been a pickup in trading interest over COVID from, let's say, millennials looking to enter the space. But also, I think, um, since we are, the topic is innovation and technology, um, asset fractalization through uh, digitization, i.e. tokenization of assets and then fraction, fractional ownership, will drive these volumes higher over time and will drive more participation on exchanges, which again will put additional strain on their exchange systems and will require 
you know, an upgrade of matching engines and core technology. I think actually, I think it's a really interesting point, Dave, you bring up. Did, didn't the CEO of JPX resign or something? I mean, it's... Um, so and I, then I, the chairman came down and is taking a, a, a half pay. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a big shame, cultural shaming thing. I, yeah, I wasn't, yeah ab absolutely. But I, I think, I mean, it's, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because you might have a too big to fail if the exchange businesses has all been about the consolidation, let's put more and more businesses through a single technology, which in, in a way you would hope the, the regulators would say, right, come up with different technology solutions. My fear is that, that unless the regulators kind of force that upon the exchange groups, it could actually potentially be a constraint against innovation. Because if you're sticking with the old technology, that's going to mean you're sort of, you know, staying in your own kind of, you know, backyard looking at the existing technology. So I think it's, it is a really important development, particularly when you've had so much consolidation and, and more is, you know, um, coming down the road the next 18 yeah. months. To, to, add, to add quickly to that, it, it's interesting that we, we haven't had the word cyber at any point in an innovation uh, panel. But it's not a concern. It just doesn't come up. It's not the cause of the outages. It, the industry seems to be reasonably well put together. So the, the cause of the outages, in a lot of industries, you'd be saying, well, you need to diversify to protect against uh, exploits and, uh, and weaknesses. That's not been the issue in this industry. It, it's the ability to support innovation and drive the business models in different way, ways. And I don't know how many people here have been in FR1 and been into the Deutsche Borsa room where they have their, their servers. But you, you go into that room and the sheer amount of kit that is in there to be able to support the service is mind boggling. And when you come from a, a sort of modern architectural view, you take a look at it and you think, there's just an enormous amount of, uh, of assets that really needs to be deprecated, taken off the balance sheet and replaced. It's, it's such a vast amount of kit. It, it cannot be the right way to do things. Okay, uh, I'm going to do some rapid. I just wanted to add something for it. to that quickly. Please do. Uh, just so people understand the scale of what James is saying, right? So we compared some of our tech in terms of how much hardware we would need to run it versus some of the incumbents. And the difference is like 60 times less server capacity we would need to run. So it's it's magnitude of scale. So you think cost in terms of collocation costs, in terms of hardware costs, maintenance costs, all of these, these venues are due an upgrade, basically. That's all I wanted to add. Interesting. Uh, okay, question for you, Jake, from... Uh our good friend, Martin Watkins, how would you encourage intermediaries to switch from deferred settlement for equities to atomic settlement, given the additional costs that they'd be hit with? Yeah, so I think, I mean, it feels a bit like switching from driving on the left hand side of the road to dri driving on the right hand side of the road, doesn't it? So Closing that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of, it, feel, it feels pretty binary. Um, I, I would say that, and you, you know, Martin will know more about this than me, but I, I think the costs of the switch would be more than justified, partly from a regulatory, you know, sort of comfort point of view, if you're, if you're settling in real time, but you then instantly free up your balance sheet. It's a, it's a bit like, you know, in the futures world, you know, you, you buy 10 lots at six, you sell them at seven, Three, minutes, three seconds later, you're flat, off you go again. So if you can truly have a kind of atomic settlement as Martin describes it, then sure, there's a one-off shift, but the benefits to the industry in terms of transparency, leverage on balance sheets. Uh, and, and I guess I'd sort of turn the question back by saying, for, for Euro, uh, it come, came out of ESMA, wasn't it? The, the percentage of settlement fails in the European securities industries is, for those of us in derivatives, it's absolutely staggering. It's like, is it like seven, eight percent or something? Yeah, so, it's high. It, it, you know, it's just a staggeringly high number. So they've got to, you know, the regulator's got to do something to force that 
atomic shift. I think. Perfect. Now, unfortunately, we're hitting uh, we're hitting the end of time. But uh, the amazing Harriet Honorable asks, I think, a key question. It was my fourth question. But uh, uh, how much of a constraint is the understanding and resources of the regulators in terms of FMI technological innovation? George, what do you think? You're on mute. Sorry, can you say that again? <laughs> How much of a constraint uh, for FMI technology innovation is on uh, resources and understanding of the regulators? How, what, what should the regulators role be? They, they've got sandboxes. Um, should they be actively encouraging? Should they be reaching out or should they be hands off? What do you think? I think, I think that it's their job to basically encourage innovation through leveling the playing field. The primary thing that's missing is understanding of technology. Um, and that leads to basically fear um, being the driving factor or fear of the unknown, I would say. So let's keep things the way they are and not change them because they seem to work, uh, which isn't necessarily conducive to innovation. So what I mentioned before, um, I would say, is the primary challenge in terms of uh, the post-trade side and uh, risk management. So the regulators understanding the implications of technology and understanding that if you can you know, track risk in real time, track deposits in real time, the system is no longer what it used to be 20 years ago, which is what the CCPs use to this day, where you mark to market you know, once or twice a day, you batch your settlements, all of that. We can, we can do reconciliation in real time. We can do reconciliation at the moment of settlement. You know, it's a different world, basically, and the regulators need to be keeping up, I think. Before I go to Jake, uh, Danny, quick question. Um, how much do the reporting authorities understand? If we hit another crisis, are they going to be able to open things up? And do they, do they have enough understanding of the technology? It took them uh, eight years to go get cool with the cloud quickly. What do you think uh, do the regulators understand? Or they, do they need more resources or to hire the services of uh, a, a Capco or uh, et cetera. Well, everyone Dave could do with a Capco, of course. Uh, no, I think the regulators have got this, this one right. They will push for the cloud. We're going to have three great years of growth. As soon as our 1946 starts, 1946 was when the world took off after the war. And there's three great years after that. That's next summer. We win the Euros, July, 20, July 12th, I think it is. We win the Euros, three great years of growth. The regulators, all we have to do, don't change regulations, just trade the, change the way the regulators access the data. Do a pull model, not a push model. People to move their stuff to the cloud, we're off to the races. Perfect, that's gold. And finally, Jake, you are all for regulators picking winners, aren't you? I was gonna, <laughs> Danny, of course, and on the day, I was trying not to be controversial, but on the day that Boris Johnson goes to Brussels to get his, you know, to get told what, told what to do. Obviously those three years of growth is gonna kick off you know, with a, with a true Brexit. No, sorry, sorry to everybody listening. I uh, couldn't resist. But the, um, right, so regulators, to finish on a very gentle point, regulators should be nowhere near innovation. The, reg, the, innov the innovation mandate should be stripped away from the SCA. Regulators know nothing about innovation. They should be doing everything they can to facilitate it within the industry and make sure all information in terms of their strategic priorities, what they're looking at, goes to all market participants, not just the big firms. But regulators should not be anywhere near having like innovation within promoting competition within their mandate. It's a disaster. That's why they're regulators. Leave it to the industry, encourage the industry. That's where the innovation will come from. All right. Excellent. Well, with that, I'd like to thank uh, the panelists, um, Jibs, for uh, for uh, introducing the uh, the audience to Capco Digital. I want to thank Natalie and Marina at Capco, who've done an amazing job of of uh, prepping and everything. And um, thank you very much. If you have any questions, you've got our details. Have a very happy holidays. <laughs>